transparency being such a big uh, piece of it so that people could relate to the authenticity of the food. And we knew we wanted to stand at the intersection of authentic and accessible. That was something that we created from the beginning. So when you have that kind of a centering, every decision then becomes easy. Let's discover the Cleveland entrepreneurial ecosystem. We are telling the stories of its entrepreneurs and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland. I am your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today I had the pleasure of speaking with Raji Sankar. Raji is the co-founder of Wholesome International, a multi-concept restaurant development company, and she also is the co-chief executive officer of Chula, a fast casual Indian restaurant owned and operated by Wholesome International with a modern commitment to good health featuring traditional Indian recipes, spices, and indoor cooking. Chula has become a beloved gem in and of itself here in Cleveland with growing presence in other cities like Pittsburgh. Raji has a refreshing perspective on leadership and company building as a student of companies before her own and mastering the best of what they have already figured out. Raji operates with a level of intentionality paid to company culture and commitment to the customer experience that feels representative of the best of what the restaurant industry has to offer. In addition, Raji is just an incredible storyteller and very fun to talk with. (laughs) So please enjoy my conversation with Raji Sankar. So I I was thinking about you know, where to start the conversation. And I, I remembered, you know, one of my closest friends brought me to Chula for the first time a few years ago. And I remember being struck really by the whole intentionality of the design, the, the transparency of the kitchen, the prominence of the tandoori ovens, the the kind of fun hand washing machines that are amazing. <laughs> and then later, of course, you know, the actual food and, and the flavors. And then thinking about how it doesn't really feel like a standard fashion casual experience. And that, you know, whole experience planted the seed of, of my uh, anticipation as I eagerly awaited the opening of your newest location in Ohio City, which I am very happy is now open and here. All that is to say, very excited to, to have you on today and to explore your story and, and the, the story of Chula. Thank you so much for having me today. So maybe it's helpful to start with just, you know, where your passion for food came from, where your interest in entrepreneurship comes from, and and where those two begin to to intersect? Great question. First of all, uh, food has been a huge part of growing up in an Indian family, uh, much like Italians, Indians, we love food, right? Any (laughs) occasion to celebrate food. We created festivals, I'm sure, just to celebrate food. Any festival in India, food is a very big centerpiece of it. Uh, Aunts and uncles and grandmothers and, you know, moms coming together and cooking up this huge meal, much like Thanksgiving, I'm sure, uh, in the United States, right? Um, Or Christmas dinners. Uh, And so that has always been a huge part of my life, uh, watching my grandmom cook. And I would be amazed by how they could do this all day long. There would be breakfast followed by lunch, then a snack uh, event, and then followed by dinner. And this uh, would go on and and on. And it was a joy for them. It was not a chore, never a chore. So that's been a huge impact for me personally. And being an entrepreneur, I did not know that that was my passion for a very Mm -hmm. long time. I was what you could call a permanent student. uh, So I pursued a degree in metallurgical engineering and then a master's in mechanical engineering, went to school for uh, artificial intelligence and then ended up getting an MBA. And that's where uh, the very first uh, year, I remember the first semester, Entrepreneurship 101, Mm. and just absolutely changed my mind about what is it that I was looking for. And it's so fun to create, right? Create something from nothing. 
literally that's what entrepreneurship is about. And sometimes you don't even know what you're seeking until you go through that process. And sometimes it can be very frustrating and you think you're creating A and you end up with something completely different. And that's all the joy of entrepreneurship. And it doesn't matter if you're you know, some doing something in healthcare, like you described, or food, or textiles, or anything else, is just remarkable. It's something out of nothing. Mm. So, how did you know this was what you were looking for, and and you know what what kind of came out of that in the immediate aftermath? So I took this class and we got to have a competition as part of the class, right? So we were divided up into groups and we created different businesses, fake businesses, mock businesses, and then we would have a competition at the end of the class. I was just blown away by the creativity of not only my group, but everyone around. And they say, you'll know when you see it. And this was one of those moments being in the class. And I still remember the final competition. The professor handed out single dollar bills to each one of us. And we had to vote for the best plan that we had heard. And uh, our team placed second. Do you know the first team was a food company? It was a restaurant company. And I remember uh, being, I actually voted for that group, even though I had, <laughs> I could have, you know, just given it to ourselves. Uh, it was that great. And uh, I think that might have been the beginning of a seed inside of me saying, how exciting uh, that you get your scorecard the same day when you're in food. You know, you did a great job or you didn't. You get to be with people. We are social beings. And uh, having that ability uh, to connect through food is something really special. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely is. And so at what point do you come to, you know, this is the path that I would like to pursue going forward? So we're talking about the restaurant world, right? Yeah. Uh, or- my business partner, Randir, and I, we had looked at multiple industries uh, once we decided we were going to partner together. And I'm very blessed. We've been partners for 21 years now. It's not very often that uh, you get to have a journey uh, with like-minded uh, people, same uh, philosophy, uh, something larger than yourself being your focus, right? Uh, so I've been very lucky that way. So when we were looking at multiple industries, food was something that constantly kept coming up, not only because we loved you know, exploring a food, we are active you know, in our own uh, food uh, you know, world in terms of foodies, love different kinds of foods, uh, but also the ability to bring something that is clean and wholesome, something that we grew up on, right, in our childhoods, bringing that uh, to the world. And uh, we were actually on a search for something that might already exist, and we really didn't find anything. And that's where we ended up creating Chula. You know, at that point, what what questions were you asking? Like, was there a vision or, you know, was it just through the exploration of looking for something that maybe already existed and, and not finding it that you're like, all right, there's a void that we need to, to try and fill here? So actually, yeah, we wrote our first business plan in 2003. We didn't call it Chula back then, uh, but we knew we wanted the fast casual space as we were looking at. Um, the world, uh, the Paneras and the Chipotle's were just emerging. I would imagine they were probably just a hundred stores or so. And uh, it was uh, remarkable to see how people were gravitating towards a meal that was quick, but at the same time, it was full of integrity in terms of the quality of the meal, the ingredients. It wasn't necessarily fast food, but still a family of four could enjoy a meal out and uh, do that quickly because double income families, people working, uh, kids in different kinds of events. We started to see that shift in the United States and specifically the places that we were living in. And uh, we felt fast casual was the right place. At that time, fast casual wasn't the common theme that you hear today. Uh, (laughs) It was just, you know, starting, emerging. And we knew we wanted to create an Indian fast casual. And we wrote a business plan. And it's amazing that we pull back, pull out the business plan once in a while. And 
it's exactly what Chula is today. It's shocking even the menu items that we had created. But the idea behind it was fresh, premium ingredients, bold flavors. And it's about flavors, not fire necessarily burning your tongue, but about being able to enjoy the complexities of it and uh, being able to bring something to our markets. You know, Indian food is very popular in the UK and South Africa and many other parts in the US. Uh, Mexican has been very successful. Mediterranean was just emerging uh, on a trend and Chinese has been around for a very, very long time. We felt that the palates were starting to emerge. We would go to uh, Whole Foods and look at their shelves and we would see Mm. uh, how much space was allocated to ethnic foods and Indian foods. And you look at it back then versus now, uh, it's extraordinary what a remarkable change. Even Target has shelves devoted to Indian food. Can you can you share a little bit about the community ovens concept and how that, that ties into it? So chula means oven, and uh, it's a take on community oven. In uh, the very old days, uh, there used to be holes in the ground, and they would put charcoal in the ground, and they would have skewered meats, cheeses, and the bread would be slapped to the side of this pit, uh, fire pit, if you will. And then that's how food was shared. And it's such a great economic engine when you think about it, being able to share the fuel, uh, have a common oven for the entire community and a great gathering place where at the end of the day, Uh, sharing the good, the bad, the ugly, commiserating with each other, celebrating with each other. So that really was the gist of what we wanted to bring to the modern times, except now you're sitting at a community table and watching the tandoor ovens right in front of you while you watch the bread being made and pulled out, while you watch the skewered proteins uh, being pulled out. So that's really uh, how uh, Chula came to be. And you'll see in each one of our restaurants, we have community tables. And so with this, you know, vision, you know, the, the actual plan, how, how do you go about making that a reality? Well, you know, what are the steps that you take? How does, how does the first store, you know, come, come to exist? So um, actually, when we first started, we wrote the business plan, we shelved it uh, for a while because we mm had no clue how to run restaurants, right? (laughs) Uh, So we ended up uh, going the franchising route and uh, we had um, experiences of both good and bad. We have um, been very blessed to be a part of a wonderful franchise. We also learned and took our lumps from another franchise that you won't hear much of today because that didn't make it. So it was a very powerful training ground for us. We learned uh, what the best uh, do and we also learned what not to do. So there is a lot of lessons from both. Uh, And often you think, oh, failure is a bad thing, but failure is a great teacher. And uh, we were able to figure out things that we would have never known that these are important, right? Supply chain has to be so, so strong. In a restaurant world, uh, if you don't have the ingredients, if you don't have the food, what are you going to serve? You have no product. So we learned a lot along those lines. How do you keep that robust? Uh, And then also it's a people business. Whatever anyone else says, it's hospitality uh, at its core. And uh, so if you don't have the heart in soul inside uh, the uh, restaurant, it doesn't matter what you're trying to serve, right? So that those were all big lessons that we learned along the way. So once we got that under our belt, we decided to go back to the drawing board and uh, we had a great team in place. And Randir actually moved to India for two years with his family. And uh, we had test kitchens in India and in Lakewood, actually, in Cleveland. And we didn't uh, make it public. It was quiet. For two years, we worked on the concept, the recipes. We Mm. didn't know much. It was actually great. Being ignorant sometimes can be bliss. Uh, And this (laughs) was one of those things where, you know, we were just so bold and took chances on things we would probably not know if we were that knowledgeable. It was super uh, fun to see uh, how that came together. We've been very blessed with amazing people who came into our lives, incredible leaders, you know, whether it is the production of the food or whether it is creation of the design or whether 
there it is the architecting of the recipes incredible incredible leaders uh, whose shoulders we stand on today that is how it came together. Everybody creating something magical. Uh, we had created our mission, vision, and values in 2011 that we had crystallized. We always used to have a version of it every year that we were in business. But in 2011, we crystallized, hey, we want to create something that will transform the lives of everyone we touch. We actually post that in our uh, locations. And how do you transform? Oh, let's just create something huge, something that we hadn't thought of. And uh, that's how it uh, started. And then we opened uh, on Black Friday in Cleveland in 2014. Uh, it turns eight years old this year. We had no idea what people would say or not say <laughs> about the food. Uh, <laughs> and we were just shocked uh, to see the reception. There were people who had actually never had Indian food um, to people who had pre preconceived notions uh, saying it's going to be a certain way. And then there were people who ab absolutely loved the cuisine. So um, we found an audience for all of them and they adopted us. They actually made it uh, happen for us. So I'm very grateful we started in Cleveland. Oh, that's, that's amazing. A lot of different threads that I, I would like to, to pull on there. You know, before we get to the evolution of it, I think there are a lot of elements that, that you just mentioned that went into uh, you know, at the onset, your vision for what this would look like. And that, that is everything from the aesthetic and whole, you know, feel of what the restaurant looks like to the food itself. But I really feel there is a very strong brand with, with Chula. And I, I'd love to, you know, just get your perspective and, and help us unpack how and why you, you thought about those kinds of decisions that you made that, that has led it to, to feel this way that it feels as a restaurant. So, you know, we um, have been students of uh, Malcolm Baldridge. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am not. It's about a uh, framework for excellence, right? And the private sector actually uh, helped create this, even though it's something instituted by the government every year. Um, it's given out by the government, but uh, it's an incredible framework for excellence. So, before we even opened the restaurant, before we did anything, we actually wrote an organizational profile, which is basically a vision for what you would like uh, to see happen. And um, we had a wonderful coach who helped us think through that process in terms of what should be in it. And uh, so we got a wonderful outline of what should be in it. And we wrote down the organizational profile. It had to satisfy our mission, vision and values. And the mission was to delight every guest every time creating raving fans. So how do you do that? And that has to start from the moment you walk in uh, to the restaurant, right? Indian restaurants, just if you're not familiar with the cuisine, could have been intimidating. Strange uh, experience. If we had gone uh, a completely different route, that might have been not as easy to connect to or it may not have been as relatable. So we knew when you walked in, you have uh, this beautiful museum of contemporary art experience. And uh, that was the vision for our uh, head of creative. And the kitchen, we knew we wanted transparency. That was fundamental uh, to what we wanted to do. And we wanted to demystify that this is something uh, mysterious, something that I cannot relate to. So how do we put the kitchen right in front, right? Uh, we reversed how typically things might be. Uh, the ovens are now the center. So you can actually see everything being cooked and you're not intimidated by that. And you can say, hey, and we also chose that we're going to be very true and pure to uh, integrity of what we wanted to serve. So no artificial colors, no preservatives. We don't have pink and orange chicken. Uh, it has to be how chicken looks, right? So the only color comes from things like turmeric. So that's how uh, it was going to be, very natural. So transparency being such a big uh, piece of it so that people could relate to the authenticity of the food. And we knew we wanted to stand at the intersection of authentic and accessible. That was something that we created from the beginning. So when you have that kind of a centering, every decision then becomes easy. That meant we are going to have open kitchens. That meant we're going to have a place where you can gather and you want to linger, right? Not just take your food and go home. And it's something that you're not afraid to try new things. You might feel more adventurous because of what you have 
it's all the five senses play into this. It's the smells that you experience when you walk into the store. Mm. It's the uh, vision of all the things around you, whether it's artwork or whether it's somebody you know, cooking chicken in the tandoors and your senses are mesmerized, your eyes are mesmerized. And then how does it feel in terms of our hand washing is a tactile, uh, tactical uh, <laughs> piece for tactile uh, sense, right? You put your hands in, it's like a jacuzzi for your hands. And how cool that you get to wash your hands without going to the restroom where you feel like you should wash again, right? When you come out. Right. Uh, and so those were all pieces of it. So the uh, senses of, uh, and then the taste, when you put the food in your mouth, how does it look when it's presented? All of those were very big elements of uh, how that had to be. A lot of it just came together. It's kind of interesting. We always say uh, when you have something uh, that is uh, intent is pure, universe shows up in various ways to make things happen. So a lot of gifts showed up in our world that guided us, people guided us, people showed up and helped us uh, through the process in places that we had no clue what to do. Hmm. That's a, I love that sentiment. I haven't actually heard of this, you know, f- framework before of the guidelines for excellence. I, I'd love to just, you know, wh- what are the other components of that? How did that shape the, the, the path forward for you? And yeah, I, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious about that. Awesome. So the Malcolm Baldrige Framework uh, for Excellence, uh, it was instituted in 1986. Companies have to apply for it. And when they do, the examiners will uh, spend hours, hundreds of hours at your company talking to guests, talking to the team members, and they basically are going to gauge you against what you say your mission, vision, and values are. And if you say, I'm going to be the best paint company, they will compare and see, is that what you, are your actions reflect what you said you would? And um, so they look at first uh, that foundation of uh, the uh, vision, mission, and core values. Then they look at how the guests focuses, how the team members uh, systems are that support that, how is the operational foundation supporting that, data and analysis, results, all of these things feature into that. And uh, so basically from soup to nuts, you are in harmony. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. That's really the center of it, congruency in every piece of it, whether it's HR, whether it's finance, whether it is guest feedback and focus. And companies that have won it, Ritz-Carlton won it twice. Only two restaurant companies have won it to date. Uh, It's a remarkable achievement because they have to show metrics and success year on year. And it's not for the lighthearted. So we never applied for the award. I don't think we're even fractionally ready for it yet. Uh, but uh, what we did, it did help us is the mindset and the thinking and the framework that we would apply to all pieces of our business. Oh, that, that's fascinating. Huh. So from there, what does Chula look like today, you know, in, in the present state? And then we can unpack, a, you know, a few of the, the learnings involved throughout that whole process. So one of the things we have learned is you can never stand still, right? You have to continuously innovate and things show up for you that force you to innovate. So the pandemic forced us to accelerate our innovations that might have happened five years later. So whether it was the technology component, which was a huge driver, uh, we uh, accelerated uh, our app. Are accelerated the quality of our app, shall we say, and the online ordering mechanism. We accelerated uh, our kiosks. We accelerated uh, a lot of guest listening systems and other team-based systems. Uh, those were things that uh, may not have happened as quickly. We also looked at how do we make the footprint more friendly and then how can we make uh, in and out very quickly. We were able to do mobile pickup windows in one of our new stores so that we could offer that wherever possible. How do we make life easy, right? Right. At the end of the day, that's really what it's about is how do we make life easy, not only for the guests, but also for the team members. So how do we streamline the kitchen so it's easier for them? So we constantly work on that. And uh, uh, we have had multiple iterations on those levels. And I don't think we'll ever stop. That is a (laughs) never ending element. Yeah, no, I I think it's it's an interesting concept thinking about the, the, the technology stack for a restaurant 
particularly as it applies to fast casual is, you know, it, it seems to be a, a core competency that these companies, you know, now have to have under the, the fast casual umbrella. And, how, you know, how, how did you adapt to that situation? I mean, you have, but, you know, what were, what were you thinking through as the, the you know, the mediums of, of interacting and ordering and uh, people, you know, consuming changed pretty rapidly? So we knew that today's uh, world, as and especially the pandemic taught us that, right? We needed to meet people where they were, uh, what they wanted. If it was curbside, it was curbside, right? If it was uh, uh, app, it was app. If it was online ordering, it was online ordering. If they wanted family meals or catering, uh, it had to uh, support that. Uh, if they didn't want to talk to anyone and just go straight to the uh, you know kiosk, that was another one. That so the biggest lesson in all of this is just give it to the uh, customer the way they want it. Give them options to be able to order the way they want. And so that was a huge driver in how we selected. And we all, always look for the best technologies we could get hold of. Sometimes the companies would not be interested in a smaller <laughs> restaurant company, uh, but we were able to persuade them over time that, hey, this is the right uh, thing for them to align with us. And emerging brands are a very big imp- impact for a lot of those companies because today's emerging brand might become tomorrow's uh, something bigger. Right. So you, you mentioned in your own you know, professional journey before Chula, this, this exploration of you know, franchise model for restaurants. As you've navigated the, the growth of the brand and the opening of new stores, how have you kind of done that that balance of corporate ownership versus franchise and 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 just more generally how you think about growth ah growth is why every every business <laughs> hopes for right <laughs> that's really also one of our values by the way one of our core values is personal and professional growth uh, so when you look at our world currently chula is all homegrown and we don't have any uh, franchising yet. I don't know what the future will bring, right? One thing we have learned, uh, especially after the pandemic, is be very open uh, to all possibilities (laughs) because growth is uh, really what it's about. So the future could uh, turn into many, many different ways uh, and many possibilities. So our commitment is we're going to stay open to all things that uh, are right for the brand. That's very important, that we are true to the brand, right for the brand and that it's right for our team. What do you learn with, you know, subsequent store openings that you don't, you know, at the onset of, of starting a restaurant? So when we started, oh, well, we went through menu iterations too, right? We used to have a much larger menu. And then we finally focused and narrowed it down to the menu that makes sense. So I'll give you some examples. When we first started, uh, we had this wonderful uh, set of uh, a pickle and a relish and all kinds of things that was homemade and garnishes really is what you could call them. And we would have our protein and we kept getting feedback like, wow, Wow, where is the rice? Where is the rice? And so we realized, hey, this is what people really are angling for. They don't give too much credit for our garnishes, even though we thought they were very pretty. And uh, we used to take a lot of time to make them, right? Uh, so we ended up uh, shifting our uh, focus into what the customer really, really needs and wants. And uh, that's how our signature bowls evolved. So we have something called uh, the perfect balance, uh, which I don't know if you've had a chance to have that. It's your vegetables and protein, your uh, masala, and your choice of either greens or rice. So that came from those kinds of iterations. So listening uh, to the customer and also knowing what your true north is. And if you can marry the two, it's a very, very powerful thing. That's one example of what we learned. We also learned, you know, we used to have varieties of different things in, in you know, in terms of uh, the flavors that people prefer. What would they really like, whether it came to lemonades or whether it was our dessert? Those were pieces. We also tested so many different varieties when we were in our test kitchen of the types of things we would serve. Uh, There were some very complicated elements. So if we can't prepare that the same way uh, every time, 
that is a disservice uh, in saying that our mission is uh, to delight every guest every time. So those were the kinds of things that we worked on, whether it was menu, whether it was technology, whether it was the footprint itself. And whether it was a design, how the kitchen evolved, we're probably on our fifth or sixth generation of our uh, design in every aspect, the signage, uh, you name it, all of it, the textures, the flooring, everything went through a renaissance. Where, when you think about expansion and growth, do you see Chula growing into next so we have a, a wonderful dream, Chula in every corner of the globe. I have no idea how that's going to happen, right? <laughs> and uh, all we could do is just this was a uh, you know dream we have, and uh, universe willing, we'll find uh, you know opportunities and options yes. opening for well, that. I'm I'm grateful it's in Ohio City, um, <laughs> in my my corner of the world. But uh, no, I, that, what you just said, I actually just finished reading. Uh, a book called The Alchemist. And I, th- I think the core message of it is that when you want to achieve something, the universe will conspire in helping you to achieve it. So that's one of my favorite books. It's Paul Coelho, right? Uh, yes, yes. It's uh, one of my favorite books. Yes. So, so, I love you that. Know, the, the, the plan aside, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and that's really what we, uh, and, you know, our focus is let's do the right things. Let's, uh, you know, focus on making sure, uh, and we actually also work a lot on how do we make this place a better place for our team? And that has been a big focus. Uh, the pandemic has taught us um, a great lesson, right? It's not, uh, we want more of everything. We don't want one dimensional lives. Uh, we want to be connected. We want to see our creative potential at its peak. We want uh, our uh, career to reflect that. We want our individual lives to reflect that. We want to be able to travel. We want to be able to do whatever we want in life. And that, those are things that it's a dream. If we can have everyone reach their peak potential in our world, that would be so exciting and it would be uh, soul filling. Hmm. Well, I, I think that gets at where, where I want to go next, which is, you know, in retrospect, the kind of impact that you hope to have as a business and, and what, what does success, you know, mean and, and look like to you? So for us, um, and that's where we come back to our vision of transforming the quality of lives of everyone we touch. So if it's a team member and their families, them whether they are here with us for a short period of time, it might be a student on their way to do something else eventually, completely different. Or it, So for them to uh, get amazing skills while they are with us and have a great time and look back and say this was one of the best experiences they had or one of the best first experiences they ever had. Or it could be a, a career uh, team member with us who experiences growth. We have so many stories. We just celebrated a 15th anniversary of one of our team members uh, just not too long ago. He went from being a crew member to an area director, right? And so it's so exciting to see that person grow, not only as in the steps, if you will, as career steps, but also as an individual, seeing that person thrive. And I know uh, when they got married, when they bought their first house, when they had their first child, those kinds of things. It's exciting to have been a part of that. It's also for our guests that they feel that if they have allergies or if they had, you know, gluten uh, issues or if they had uh, vegetarian or vegan preferences, that we are a place where, um, you know, it doesn't prevent them from having a great option or great many options for themselves. And we talk about caring what we put in our bodies. And that's what our food hopefully reflects for the people who enjoy our food and uh, for communities, for us to be able to not just job creation, but being integral part of it. We love having fundraisers in our worlds and give 30% of the uh, you know fundraiser proceeds to the charities. It's a huge part of who we are. That is fundamental to our vision. So us being able to, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of lives would be awesome. A uh, billion lives would be even more awesome uh, as a legacy that we made an impact on. So I don't know what it could be, but whatever uh, we are, uh, you know, given an opportunity to, that would be uh, so remarkable and so fulfilling. Something you mentioned earlier, I want to circle back to, 
which is, you know, what is the importance of, of coaching in the entrepreneurial process and, and how that, that is actually, you know, kind of manifested for you? I find that also very interesting. You know, coaching is so important and I have been blessed with coaches and I am always seeking coaches for myself. So I um, have a wonderful meditation coach who allows me with introspection. I have a coach who helps me think through business issues, right? And how do you, uh, and then on the human relations equation, uh, you know, having uh, people who mentor me. So I think coaching is uh, something that we have seen athletes get. And so they get them to see their blind spots and help them elevate their game. So that's true for every human being. And coaches come in different ways. Parents can be coaches. Your friend can be your coach, right? It doesn't mean you have to necessarily have a very unique uh, model of coaching is just one way is someone uh, who is called a coach. But I found coaching and I learned from my peers. I learned from uh, my business partner who is an amazing coach for me. Uh, So that is, uh, I think coaching is essential for you to know uh, where you stand. Somebody who's not afraid to tell you honestly, and somebody who helps you elevate your game. I learned this, that accountability is constant and never ending conversation on rules of the game. So if someone is not helping you with that, uh, it's hard to see for yourself. And I have not been involved that much that I can just see it for myself yet. So uh, (laughs) I found that to be a very powerful, um, you know, a creative source for myself. From the Outside looking in, you know, what are some things that you wish people knew about what it is to to run a a restaurant business? So I think uh, one of the things is that a lot of times you wonder the uh, workforce in, uh, you know, restaurants who actually goes to work. It's amazing. We have college graduates. <laughs> we have had a doctor uh, who was uh, studying for his uh, uh, credentials uh, from another country and uh, he worked with us on his way. Uh, you'll find um, single moms trying to make uh, a better life for their kids. So hospitality is a unique industry where they are there selflessly serving others, right? While they're pursuing uh, whatever the necessary needs are at home. So I think just the amount of struggle that some of uh, the people might have. And at the same time, there might be somebody who is just using this as a stepping stone and a great place because they love serving. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is a specific, I think. So it's a huge blessing to be able to work there. You learn so many skills that uh, is actually, I think, underrepresented. You learn how to, um, you're part psychologist by the time you're, uh, if you're a great cashier, right? (laughs) If you're a great guest ambassador, you really become a, a great psychologist because you know how to read people, how to relate to people. And what an extraordinary skill that is in whatever you do in life, whether it is with a spouse or whether it is uh, with with your family, whether it's with friends or peers at work, uh, that's a skill that you'll never lose. So there's so many skills you can learn. You learn about production uh, management. You learn about, uh, you know, obviously customer service being a part of it. Uh, you learn about financial management. So a restaurant is as if it were a full organization and you can have many, many parts. Uh, you could literally have a full uh, tour of all aspects of a business. It gets at one of the, the other questions I, I wanted to ask about, but I, I think you've kind of already addressed it, but at the, you know, the transferable skills that, that, that you acquire through, you know, restaurants as it applies to, to business more generally and, uh, and to entrepreneurship. Cause I, I've often found that there is this parallel between, you know, the proverbial chef and, and, and the founder. You are so right. And you have supply chain, right? Um, You have real estate. If you really think about it, it is a a little uh, city of its own, teeming with so many different pieces. There is utilities. You you learn about all aspects uh, within the restaurant business. So when there is a great uh, business run, this is something that uh, they can take into other worlds. It's not just restaurants. So 
and forgive me for pulling you in all these detours, but I want to go back actually to one thing you had also mentioned earlier, uh, which was about that maintenance of the integrity of of the supply chain and and specifically as it relates to tandoori food and ingredients. How that how does that actually look like in in practice? Uh, you know the 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 sourcing of of spices and and that whole production process. So we started with the concept of you're going to get off the shelf spice blends, right? Uh, and then we realized very quickly that we couldn't get the level of paperwork we wanted um, for uh, consistency and uh, also the source all the way, source tracking. Uh, And so we actually have our own spice blends. We make our own spice blends from scratch. We uh, have about a dozen spice blends. And that's not an easy thing to do, but we realized that's the only way we could get to clean trackable spice blends and also consistency. So there is no caking, anti-caking agent in our world, right? When we make our own spice blends, it's also the freshness of the taste profile. Uh, If you leave a a spice blend on the shelf for three years uh, or two years, as might be the case in some instances uh, when you're trying to buy off the shelf, that won't have the same taste as uh, when you're uh, looking at something that might have been ground a few days ago. Hmm. So we learned very quickly that in order to, so we looked at all those places where there could be breakdowns and we set ourselves up uh, so that even if it's harder and if even if you have to make your own uh, proprietary spice blends, it just changes um, the long-term equation. No, it, it seems like this core asset ultimately as you begin to scale as, a, as an organization as well. You're absolutely right. So I think we've covered a, a lot of you know different topics here. Uh, I just kind of want to you know open the floor up for you if there are you know parts of of what it is to run Chula, parts of your own journey that that we haven't you know touched on yet that you think are are particularly important. I'd love to to hear about that, and uh, and we can you know work towards bookending the the conversation here. So for me, like, I think the biggest part has been, it's a journey of discovery, right? Self-discovery. How badly can I break down? How, um, (laughs) you know, elated can one get, right? Uh, So, uh, and then uh, it's a uh, spiritual journey. Business is a spiritual journey. Uh, Any entrepreneur will tell you it's never uh, like an easy coaster uh, kind of situation. It's always a roller coaster experience and uh, anticipating is not always easy. And I doubt we can anticipate everything, right? Uh, But being prepared is something we can definitely do every single day. And uh, so it has been an incredible spiritual journey in the sense of personal growth you know, learning, having breakthroughs after breakdowns, right? And breakdowns are part for uh, a part a part of the course, and you can't ignore that, and you can't expect that that will never happen, or challenges won't exist. But how we deal with them, sometimes not so gracefully, other times surprising ourselves, right? So th- that's been sort of uh, what we have seen. Every time we thought this is too hard. Uh, there has been a uh, you know surprising element of something good showing up mm-hmm. that would get us through, uh, but we've found that psychology of the founders is what it all starts and ends with, uh, and so we work very hard on the psychology of ourselves as much as we can. Randir and I focus a lot on that, and uh, are we at our best every time? No, but what we try to do is try to get back to our uh, center as much as possible and as quickly as possible. I love that. And I think uh, it is, it is very important <laughs> to take care of, of yourself through the, <laughs> through the journey because it, it is hard. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, for us, it's about the, how can our team reach their peak potential? So we're constantly, we're junkies when it comes to learning about uh, how do we um, get to be the best individually collectively, team-wise. We have made so many mistakes too along the way, right? Those have been great teachers for us, not by choice, uh, sometimes uh, without, you know, intending to. And uh, we learned a lot. And I think those have been, and being able to accept uh, that you will fail, that was probably one of the toughest things to learn. Right. 
it, it, it's baked right into the, the, whole, the whole company building process. It's part of the journey. Yes. Yes. Well, we can uh, close out here with my uh, traditional closing question, which is for not necessarily your favorite thing in Cleveland, but for something that other folks may not necessarily know about. So a hidden gem, if, if you will. So I'm going to actually give uh, a shout out to a neighbor of ours in Ohio City, uh, Mitchell's Ice Cream. I love uh, their place. It is so fun to watch your ice cream being made and uh, talk about transparency, which is close to my heart, yes. right? <laughs> uh, it's just awesome to see. There is a shared ethos there. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, going there and I love uh, the... Uh, um, you know, experience there. That's one of my favorite places. Awesome. It, it is, it is a special place. Well, I just want to thank you again so much for, for coming on and, and for, for sharing your, your story. And I, you know, personally am a big fan of Chula, like, like I had mentioned. So, uh, I was very happy to, uh, to have you on and, uh, had been looking forward to, to this one for a while. Thank you so much. Uh, and, it's been such a privilege to be a part of your podcast and uh, I'm grateful. Of, I learned a lot from you as well. And I'm uh, absolutely grateful for the fact that you do what you do and you share so much through your podcast. And, uh, and I wish you tremendous success. Oh, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. If folks had anything that they wanted to follow up with you about, what would be the, the best way for them to do so? So they can reach us at chula.com. They can also follow us uh, on our Instagram, Chula Yum uh, is our handle. And as is our Facebook handle, Chula Yum. Uh, it's C-H-2-O's, L, two A's, and then H, Chula and Chula Yum. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Thank you. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So if you have any feedback, please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on Twitter at podlayoftheland or at sternhefe, J-E-F-E. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with The Up Company, LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on the show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.